degrees. Get Linden Apple Center. Do you have any test operation in restricted area 2508? Area 31, Roger. The traffic is quite luminous and is exhibiting some non ballistic motion. Over. Roger, Area 31. Continue to send at your discretion. Over. Okay, Center. The traffic is approaching head on, ultra bright, and really moving. They're right by us, right now. There are a thousand UFO sightings reported around the world every month. 90% of these sightings can be explained, but 10% cannot. Officially and unofficially, the U.S. military has been investigating UFOs since 1947. Their top secret goal is to find out what's behind these unexplained sightings. The Pentagon classifies them as unusual airborne anomalies, but a better term is X-Files. Join us now as Mac One One and Commander Cobra explore these unsolved cases, UFO incidents that baffle even the U.S. military. This is Mac Maloney's Military X-Files. And now, here's Mac Maloney. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Mac Maloney's Military X-Files show here on the Distant Thunder Radio Network. Hey, this is Mac Maloney, and I'm in the studio tonight with the very lovely Lois Lane. Hi, Mac. Hi, everyone. It's really good to be here. This is a very special show tonight, Lois, in a series of special shows we've been doing recently. Regular listeners to our show probably know that we're good friends with Martin Willis. Martin Willis of Podcast UFO, very, very popular podcast, almost up to 500 episodes. And um, also they might know that we're in the same kind of geographical location as Martin, which is uh, north of Boston. But as it turns out, we record our show the same night he records his show, 6 to 8.30 p.m. on Tuesday night. So we very rarely have the opportunity to have, be guests on each and other's shows. That changed uh, lately when we took some time off, and Martin was nice enough to invite me on his show, along with a great author named Graham Rendell. And what we talk about in the show is a very, very deep dive into Foo Fighters of World War II. Not the rock band, but Foo Fighters is what people called UFOs, flying saucers during World War II. And Graham was able to get into all kinds of past records of the RAF, and the U.S. Air Force Bomber Command to see exactly what people saw and what they didn't see. Very, very cool show, Lois. So what we're going to do is we're going to rebroadcast that show on our show tonight. What do you think? Well, I think people are in for a real treat and an educational and entertaining program. We want to be educational and entertaining, as you know. So before we do this... Lois, can you remind people how they can get to their bag of swag? Of course, Mac. Everybody, just click, go to MacMaloney.com, click on the Contact Us button, and give us your real mailing address, and we will put together a bag of swag for you. It includes pins and coasters and 3D decals, lots of cool stuff. So again, click on the Contact button on MacMaloney.com, and we will send you... A bag of swag. Well, listen now, Lois, full disclosure. You want to guess, want to have our audience guess how many times we've tried to do this opening? I'm going to say the over under is 35 times, maybe. <laughs> I'm thinking that's about right, Mac. Okay. okay. Well, anyway, without further ado, uh, we're going to get to the rebroadcast of Martin Willis's podcast UFO, show number 487. I was a guest on there with uh, author Graham Rendell. So you're listening to Mac Maloney's Military Expo show here on the Distant Thunder Radio Network. Have a listen. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host, and we have a great one lined up for you tonight. I have help tonight from my friend Mac Maloney. He's an author. He runs a show. Usually he's recording his show exactly the same time my show is up, but he's got a couple weeks off. So I yanked him in here. He's going to help me co-host through this show. He also had a book, Wartime, um, UFOs in Wartime, something like that. Mac, I'm probably destroying the title to that. Our guest tonight is Graham Randall, and he Randall, and he has um, a book out about the Foo Fighters, uh, UFOs uh, prior to Roswell. It's basically what we're going to be talking about. And uh, great guest from England. He's staying up late for the show. Our blog this week is a UFO and humanoid in space, and you know it's kind. It's for fun. Okay, it's it's like a Christmas. Uh, 
more or less a Christmas blog. Just uh, I, I don't want to give a spoiler, but it's a small, short blog this week. Uh, Charles does a great job. I always like everything that he writes. And every blog is turned into a audio blog. I don't know about this one in particular. But anyway, um, these shows that I'm running at break seem to be very popular when people are talking about their UFO encounters. So if you'd like to, if you had like a really interesting UFO encounter and you'd like to record like a three minute session, uh, feel free to reach out to me at martin at podcastufo.com. I will tell you this, I'm getting a lot of email and uh, I will caution you. It's much easier if you write kind of a short email. Sometimes I get them four pages long and I just cannot, uh, I just have too much to read to get through all those emails. So I will try to answer every single email that I get. I have uh, someone that is uh, coming forward for for the first, uh, he may have been on another show, but he's, he's coming forward uh, who was actually uh, one of the witnesses at Rendlesham forest. He's coming up on the 18th of January, just to let you know, Uh, Gary Nolan, I mentioned was coming up. He's going to be, he can't be on the show until March. And Lou Elizondo will be on in March as well at some point. So I yesterday I ran one of my first, uh, well, my first everything else show since I think it was 2016 when I used to run them. And uh, it was inside Russia with a gentleman called uh, named Constantine. Very nice guy. And he was very brave at some of the things he said about Russia. I, I worry a little bit about with some of the things that he said. That's on our um, YouTube channel only. That's not going to be made into a podcast. Those are coming up randomly. Um, but it's kind of funny. It's like all these people started posting comments. Oh, this isn't UFOs. What's going on? Everyone wants to know about UFOs. So I put in the title, not UFOs. Well, Constantine uh, saw that this morning and emailed me. He says, do you want to talk about UFOs in Russia? <laughs> because his family and himself he uh, he has had some encounters, so uh, I'll bring him back. He's a great guy. And so if you want to watch that, that's on our YouTube channel. And if you want to get notifications for when we do those shows, I'll try to put them in the newsletters if I can. But if I can't, um, all you have to do is subscribe to the channel and click the little bell, and that'll send you email notifications anytime that we have um, shows that will pop up that otherwise you would not know about. So, um, and those are random days, random, hopefully most of them will be in the evenings. But um, so I never know exactly what day. It's going to be a day that's convenient for myself and convenient for a guest. And hopefully we'll have all kinds of interesting shows. I do have a lot of ideas. I have a couple of emails out to people and hopefully we'll get, again, maybe a show a week or one every few weeks. Again, it's random. And uh, I don't really want to start a mailing list. I really don't want to do podcasts for that, just for the YouTube channel only. So I think that's enough of me babbling. First of all, I'd like to bring in my good friend, Mac Maloney. Welcome, Mac. Hi, Martin. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's it's always fun to have you on. Um, and you're, you're usually recording your show now. And who knows, you know, if this thing that we're going through ever changes, uh, you know, we'll do those in-studio live Shows again. That was a blast. Show. Yeah. Oh, we had a lot of fun uh, doing uh, the live show at uh, WXEX in uh, Exeter, New Hampshire. A lot of That's fun. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. So hopefully we'll get to do that more. Mac, um, before I bring Graham in, what was the name of the, the I think I butchered the title of your book. What What, what is it called? Uh, your Foes in Wartown. I, I think I sort of got it, maybe. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. I got it. Okay, I did. Uh-huh. And uh, now I'd like to bring in our guests all the way from the UK, Graham Randall. Randall, welcome to the show. Hello. How are you both? We're, we're doing great. Uh, really good to see you. Thank you for your willingness. Uh, first of all, uh, Graham, before we get going on you know, your book in general, can you tell us a little something about yourself? You know, What got you interested in the topic to begin with? Yeah, sure. Um, from about the age of four year old, I was given model aircraft kits to to keep myself quiet um, by my mother. And the model kits had, it, apart from the instructions, had sort of little pot of histories of the aircraft involved. So I got into aviation sort of history that way by ta- uh, learning about the old aircraft like Spitfires, Messerschmitts, all this kind of thing. And that right. developed into a history of World War Two. And about five years later, when I was eight or nine years old, um, I was already reading science fiction books 
by about that time. Uh, Isaac Asimov, those those kind of novels, uh, I, was, I was quite a quick study. I was, I was reading quite well by then. And my mother, God bless her, um, thought she was doing me a favour by buying me a book which looked like one of the Isaac Asimov covers, which was this, which oh, cool. was um, a book by uh, Brunzo Leopold Trench, because it had a spacecraft on the front of it. She thought that was one of those. It turned out to be a book on UFOs. So that's where my interest started <laughs> from. That book's quite nice. dated. Um, a lot of the stuff in there actually is a bit suspect, but you know that's where it all started. So I started reading everything I could find on those as well. Um, mm -hmm. And basically it just kicked off from there. And of course, the Foo Fighters is where everything comes together. So my interest in aviation, in German secret weapons from the war, and also from UFOs, all combines. So, you know, the, the Foo Fighters, you know, were, were early on, you know, I guess in the typical thing that I think a lot of us do in when we're looking at UFOs, we pretend like nothing happened before 1947. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of kind of like that. When in fact, you know, there was even, uh, you know, I've talked to Dave Marler, there's been triangle sightings, even, you know, the turn of the century. And, you know, um, so there goes the, that theory of them being military aircraft, you know, possibly some of them are today, who knows. But, um, but anyway, um, so we think of UFOs as the modern era, I guess that's the best way to put it. And, you know, I've talked to people like at astrophysicists, and they say things like, you know, for civilizations to line up in in their technology and things like that, it's like, you know, a million to one type of sure. thing. So they could have been visiting for a million years or, you know, whatever. So, or long before people were ever here. Uh, these possibilities, whoever it is that's visiting us, again, uh, I always say this, I don't know who it is that, that are driving these uh, crafts, but uh, but anyway, so... Um, you, aviation, is that something you've been interested in all your life? Yeah, I, I used to write for an aviation magazine some time ago. Um, I dropped out of UFOs a bit towards the end of the 1990s and through the early 2000s because it was going a bit stale as far as I was concerned. The, the, the kind of the excitement was going out of it for me. Like a lot of people, you know, your interests come and go. Um, so I was more into the sort of writing on aviation matters than I was about looking and researching UFOs. Um, but that came back in 2017. Like a lot of people came back with the three videos. I was already sort of gravitating back into the into the interest anyway but that really galvanized me into trying to do more um and obviously it's a bit it's a different ball game nowadays to be able to research and to write than it was when i was a youngster when i was first getting into ufos um you know back then i only had well you didn't have the internet when i first got into this uh, i only had my local library as a resource nowadays you know you, the world's your oyster um there's so much stuff online that you can that you can actually research even with covid going on last year when i uh, or earlier this year rather when i wrote the book the, the amount of information I could find in terms of official records and RAF records, Royal Air Force records, was astounding. Um, and, you know, it just went from there. So it was, and it, being able to find information from your side of the, the Atlantic as well was quite easy uh, just by using the internet. So finding source documentation, which I didn't want to write a book where it was just me throwing a whole load of theories out there and just seeing what would stick again. You know, if I throw them against the wall and see what would stick, I wanted to actually go back to source documentation and find out what the, you know, the people back then were seeing and what they were talking about, what they were describing and what they were thinking rather than me coming out with that. So the book's quite heavy on um, information. It's not very, it's quite light on me trying to say what they are because I don't know. And if anybody buys my book expecting to, to find the answers as to what these things were, I'm afraid they're going to be disappointed, but they are hopefully going to be a hell of a lot more informed than they were before they started reading it. Yeah. Uh, Mac, just to let you know, Mac, you can jump in anytime you have a, sure. a, a question. I was just going to say that um, I like um, to hear that, Graham, because um, I agree with you. Anyone who says they know what UFOs are, where they're from, uh, they're, uh, they're, they're not being truthful because no one knows. I don't think the uh, America, I don't think any military on Earth knows. I know that they have plenty of proof that they exist. It looks like the U.S. government now is actually kind of making an effort to figure out what these things are. Uh, but if anyone in this world knew what UFOs were or where they came from, we'd be living in a different world. Sure. Yeah. Um, just to true. let you know, we, we get chat 
messages up here and uh, this this one popped in. Uh, it wasn't uh, the the question is from Joni. Wasn't there one in Missouri before Roswell, New Mexico, about ten years earlier, nineteen forty one, Cape Girardeau, I believe, in Missouri. I believe that's what you're talking about. That one. I did actually have a guest, the granddaughter of uh, the gentleman, supposedly saw the bodies or whatever they were um, on this show. So yes, um, but you you are focusing mostly on the wartime. Right. Do I have that right? You do. So the title of the book is UFOs Before Roswell, European Foo Fighters, 1940 to 1945. And I picked the dates because they are where the Foo Fighters or things that you know, resembled them, other objects as well. That's mm-hmm. the time frame that, you look, that I was looking at. And I was only looking at Europe because I could fill a book with the stuff from Europe. Things happened in the Pacific War as well. But I was focusing more on what I knew more about than, than from the other side of the world. You mentioned oh. before, sorry, you yeah. mentioned before about you know how the um, the modern ufology started in 1947, and it's true. Um, when I was growing up and I was reading books about UFOs, there was a big gap in terms of the war. Um, the, the books I read, the, the one I just quoted before there, but other ones I was reading back in the 70s and the 1980s, they would talk about the mystery airships in the in the late 1800s and the early mm-hmm. 1900s. They would talk about the ghost aircraft from the 1920s and 1930s. Right, but yeah. then, then they would skip over the war and go straight to the ghost rockets in 1946 and then right. to Kenneth Arnold and to Roswell. Obviously, Roswell that came along in 1978, but the books beforehand just skipped that as well. But World War II was just... It just didn't exist as far as ufology was concerned. And even when I was young, I thought that was quite odd. That the, Because when you think about it, the amount of people who were flying around in World War II and the amount of people on the ground who were specially trained to look up into the skies to make sure no air, enemy aircraft were coming their way, you know, you have tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of trained observers and very highly trained in aircraft recognition and all this kind of thing, looking at the skies every night, every day. And yet, what, no reports? Mm-hmm. That, that didn't make sense to me. Mm-hmm. So for years, I thought there was more to it. And I did come across some references to Foo Fighters and other objects in World War II. There was... Um, you know, there was actually a report that uh, one of the intelligence officers from the 415th uh, Night Fighter Squadron, he compiled a list of 14 different sightings over the winter of 44-45, and that got passed up the chain of command. Now, that actually ended up in a, a magazine article that a, a, a chap called um, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Chamberlain, he wrote in the December 1945 uh, issue of, a, of an American Forces magazine, um, and that had some of the sightings, about half a dozen of those from that list in it. Now, that was pretty much all the information that people had to go on for about the next 50 years, with a few other exceptions, but not many. You're looking at about maybe a dozen cases in in total. And Mm -hmm. that's where most of the UFO authors in the sort of um, the 50s and the 60s and the 70s got their information from. So you saw the same information regurgitated time and time again, but there was nothing really new coming out, apart from a trickle of information. Um, Of course, I looked at Mac's book, back in, you know, years ago. Uh, oh. UFOs in Wartime was a copy behind me there on the shelf. And also Keith Chester's um, Strange Company. Mm-hmm. And they yeah, had sure. m- many more book, uh, many more sightings. But it was still an incomplete picture because it mm-hmm. was still focused on the American side of things. Now, naturally, because the author, you know, the two authors there, Mac and, and Keith, were American, that's not surprising. But I, I thought there must have been like a whole raft of RAF sightings to look at as well, and maybe from other parts of Europe. So that's where the book came from. Uh, but this kind of gap didn't make any sense to me. So I knew there must be more. Uh, and it turns out, yes, there was a hell of a lot more. Mm-hmm. Oh. Right, yes, yes. I, I was just going to jump in to basically say the same thing, is that um, that's that's how UFOs in War Time actually became a book, because I was um, – out to lunch with my editor and and i happened to mention to him because it's something that kind of was on my mind too as a young kid it's like you know why does it seem like there's more ufos in wartime than in peacetime and and we that's what we talked about is that you got so many other people look literally looking up into the sky day and night and so many other airplanes flying so many more airplanes flying around there's just more eyewitnesses on hand during war because you know, a lot of people are looking up and they see these things. And um, so, yeah, that's cool. I want to read your book, Graham. I'm not kidding you because I, I found that, you know, when we, we were doing UFOs in wartime, it's a, it's a large chapter in the book, but it's, um, it's, it's, it's a subject that could take several books. 
you know, basically yeah. if you really get into it and, and, and the, the, just in closing, you know, the only conclusion we came to is at the end of the war, G German generals and American generals got together and they basically said, um, we thought they were your secret weapons. And they said, we thought they were your secret weapons. So our conclusion was that no one knew what these were. Same thing with the Japanese. Um, Everyone saw them. Everyone assumed they were other people's, the other side's secret weapons. That way, it kind of went into a bin like, we'll look into this later. We have a war to win. And then when the war was over, it all kind of, you know, went away. Yeah. So there are a lot of new listeners that are just getting into this topic in general. Uh, I get emails all the time every week. So, um, Graham, if you could, can you explain you know, a lot of people know the Foo Fighters is a band, a rock band. But um, if you can explain to the new listener that has no idea what we're talking about, sure. what these things were. Um, I don't know where that name came from. You may know that. But um, yeah. also the characteristics of uh, okay. uh, were they all different characteristics or were there a lot of were there similar characteristics? So I'll explain where the name comes from. And it's actually quite late in the war when it was coined. But I'll also explain the kind of the full range of things that were seen during the war. So the actual name Foo Fighters, and actually there was a swear word before that. That's how the name was originally net, originally coined, or this phrase was literally coined. It was made up by a crew member from the 415th Night Fighter Squadron who were based in eastern France during the winter of 44-45 at a place called near Nancy. And for from about September onwards in 1944, some of the crews, and it was more and more as the, as the months went on towards Christmas, they were seeing these red and other sometimes other coloured lights that were either following their aircraft at night or they were sitting off their wingtip or they were seeing in the distance. And it was night after night. It got to the point where it was pretty much every night that one or more crews from this unit who were flying um, B Bristol Bowfighter aircraft, which the RAF had supplied to the Americans uh, in 1943 because they didn't have night fighters of their own at that time. And they were operating this, this twin-engined, twin-seater aircraft over uh, Western, uh, Western Germany during the night trying to shoot down Luftwaffe bombers and training aircraft and all this kind of thing or targets on the ground. And they, these lights kept appearing. Um, and of course, they were quite scared because, first of all, they thought they were German, either German aircraft, German night fighters or secret weapons, but they couldn't shift them. So they got these lights got onto the aircraft's tail and it didn't matter what the, the pilot did, throwing the aircraft around the sky, trying to lose them. They just stayed there. And then after a while, they just shot off in the distance. Now, this went on actually beyond um, the winter of 44, 45 and right into the spring. But as the war got to a close, the number of sightings dropped off a cliff it went down to zero so there was a an idea that well they must be german secret weapons because as they're taking more and more of germany and the you know they're reducing their, their ability to fight then it must it must that must be the reason because they've got no they haven't any of these weapons left but actually it was it wasn't as easy as that because these things had been seen and things like them had been seen right as early as 1940 so some of the first reports that you read uh, and you can find are from then. And in terms of Air Force reports, definite sightings, the first one I could find was dated March 1942. Um, and the cover of the book, which is actually sitting on the shelf behind me there, is a representation of an event. And, and Mac will know the one I'm, uh, I'm talking about because it features in his book as well. And it was a Polish squadron, uh, a Polish mm -hmm. unit who were fighting on behalf of the British. And it was 301 Squadron. They were based in Lincolnshire in England, and they flew Wellington bombers. And one night, they were this aircraft from this squadron was coming back from Essen in Germany in the Ruhr. And this luminous orange copper-colored disc was seen coming up behind the aircraft. And the pilot told the, the rear gunner that if it got close enough to open fire on it, which he did. Now, the bullets went into the light and nothing happened. It kept, it kept shooting at this this light, mm -hmm. thinking it was a night fighter, thinking it was a German night fighter, and nothing happened. Now, if you're shooting that many bullets into it, and you, know, you would knock it down or you would disable it or you destroy it or damage it, whatever. But the light just sat there. And then after a period of time, it moved around to the wingtip of the aircraft and sat off the wingtip for a bit. And it got to the point where it, it was positioned enough so that the actual tail gun and the nose gun turrets could open fire at the same time. And uh, that is theoretically possible if the, the light was off a certain distance off the wingtip. And they were both opening fire at it. And then it moved around to the front of the aircraft 
and the nose gunner was starting to fire at it as well. And after a while, it then shot off into the distance and disappeared. Now, that clearly rattled the crew because, well, what what flies around like that and can be shot at, but nothing's done to it? You know, it's not damaged, it's not shot down, etc. Now, this mm-hmm. had happened to an aircraft directly behind that Wellington as well, but they didn't report it. Now, neither did the Polish crew. They did talk to the intelligence crew um, officers on the ground when they landed after the raid, but nothing seems to have happened officially. However, the pilot did talk to a Vancouver-based UFO researcher in 1962, and that's where the story comes from. Uh, it ended up in Flying Saucer Review um, in the magazine in the 1960s. And there are other stories from back then. Now, that one doesn't appear in the official records, but there are others that do. There are ones that appear in August 1942 and in November 1942. There's a story of a Lancaster bomber, which is over northern Italy uh, from 61 Squadron. And the pilot and the crew see what they describe as a 200 foot long torpedo shaped object with two rows of what they thought were the lights or windows along it. And they saw it twice during the same raid over the Alps, over the, over the Italian Alps. And the second time it was flying along a mountain valley along, you know, down below them. Now, you might think that was an airship, a Zeppelin, but what the hell was a Zeppelin doing flying around in 1942? They'd long been retired by then. They weren't being right. used by the Germans. And you wouldn't fly one in a dangerous part of the world, such as a mountain range. So it didn't. none of this made sense. And, of course, there were other sightings around this time as well, but different things. So they were calling them lights to start with because the RAF, the Royal Air Force, didn't know what they were looking at. Again, they thought they were German secret weapons. But then the name changed. So rather than call them lights, they then started calling them rockets in the official reports Mm -hmm. when they started recording them. And the intelligence reports, where you can find them, if you look hard enough, uh, they mention these mystery rockets. Long before the Germans actually started fielding rockets like the V-2 and other service-to-air missiles and all this kind of thing, um, and then they started. The pilots had their own nickname for them. They were called the Thing. And there is a docu- uh, a logbook entry from a pilot who was based in in southern Italy in 90, at the end of 1943, and he mentions a dogfight with a light. And him, uh, he was in a bow fighter, night fighter. Him and, and his uh, radar observer basically had a sort of a dogfight going round and round circles with a mysterious light that they couldn't couldn't uh, chase. Well, they were chasing it, but they couldn't catch up with it. And it just latched onto their tail and then it shot off in the distance. Now, that wasn't the only story from 43. There'd been a hurricane pilot over North Africa in the spring of 43. He was a New Zealander from 73 Squadron. And he'd had a, a, an orange light attach himself to, his, to almost off his wingtip and sat there. It didn't matter what he did with the aircraft. It, it just sat there. And after a period of time, he managed to turn the aircraft enough so he could get onto its, well, figuratively tail didn't have a tail it was just a light but he managed to get behind it and he opened up it with 20 millimeter cannon nothing happened no. it just sat and then just sat off his wing again so there's all these strange stories about some things being fired at mm-hmm. but nothing happened so right. you've got lights of different colors you've got these big objects you have smaller objects there was a battle in Russia in, in February 1943, a place called Krasny Bor, which was near Leningrad. And it was a Spanish division fighting on behalf of the Germans, the 250th Infantry Division. And four soldiers from that unit saw what they described as an upturned bathtub sitting above a battle. And there were aircraft from the Russians and the Germans. They were fighting. They were, they were shooting each other down. And then there was a battle going on on the ground below them. And this thing was sitting above everything, watching what was going on. So there's stories all over the place about these kind of strange things. There were other stories from Eastern Europe as well, stories from occupied France, stories from Italy. You name it, there were stories. There's even mm-hmm. a story from the North, the North Cape of Norway, which I actually happen don't, uh, I don't happen to believe for various uh, reasons, which is too long to go into here. But there are stories from all over Europe. Let me ask you this, uh, Graham. Were there sightings from civilians or is it just military no martin the um the 1940 stories that i managed to find are from belgium and from france now they're from civilians and this is just when the german invasion started uh, there's a couple of ambulance drivers in in um in belgium saw a strange object over uh, i believe it might have been liege i can't remember exactly where it was now but uh, there was things like that being seen then. Now, you've got to remember that uh, in occupied Europe, when the Germans were in control, the last thing that the civilian would do would be report strange aircraft to the That's military true. authorities. 
because right. you, you get hauled away and put in a prison camp or worse because you know the the germans would probably immediately assume that they'd seen one of their secret aircraft um so you don't get that many civilian reports they came out after the war um and there are quite a few of them there are ones from poland there are ones from czechoslovakia uh you know so there's different countries involved there are for ones from romania as well and these are civilians on the ground which saw strange objects and they range from zeppelin shaped objects through to lights in the sky and you know, you name it everything in between there's even a story of black triangles uh, in my neck of the woods in Northumberland in England where four was seen by a spitfire pilot flying at, at uh, quite high altitude over a nearby town about 12 miles from where i live and he saw four black triangles so you know you name it it's in world war 2 right um hey Martin, if i could just yeah, yeah. jump in jump here real right quick in. Yeah. Um, there's also a story, um, Graham probably has heard of it, it's in our book, where uh, right after the war, there was a story that um, Winston Churchill was given a photo that was taken from a Lancaster bomber recon plane, um, taken from the rear gunner's position of this saucer-like craft following this airplane in broad daylight. And... Um, as the story went, uh, Churchill looked at it and realized that, you know, this, is, this isn't this is something from this earth. And uh, he mandated that the picture not be seen for 50 years. The reason being, he said, uh, this will uh, basically destroy every religion on earth because all of a sudden here's proof that we're not the only ones in the universe, let's say. And, um, and then later on, apparently after he died, again, this is how the story goes, um, they destroyed the photo. But uh, to Graham's point, uh, I think probably, you know, just the way that uh, I read some of the RAF reports and some of the Army Air Force reports, 8th Air Force reports, um, and there are a lot in um, the Pacific as well that uh, the Navy really hasn't been forthcoming with. Um, but I think that maybe just the way that you we might look at it, I bet you there's probably only about a third to a half of the actual sightings um, that were made during the war that were documented and lost, maybe somehow buried in classified information or whatever. But basically, people were seeing these things on a regular basis all over the war zone for the good four or five years of the European war. So can I go back to what you said there, Mac, about the Churchill story? Um, mm -hmm. that, I believe that actually comes from a revelation from a scientist from a few years ago. And it was a, it made the newspapers here in England as well. And he his grandfather was a bodyguard to Winston Churchill. It's actually chapter um, chapter four of my book. Um, mm -hmm. And the story is that this bodyguard was in a meeting with Churchill and Eisenhower one day. It's supposed to have happened um, yeah, 44. And uh, a mosquito coming back from Germany is supposed to have had been followed by an object. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where that story comes from. Oh, However, right, okay. the provenance of the story is the grandson and it was passed on by the mother, uh, by this, this chap's mother. He was a scientist, and he wouldn't give his name. Uh, it's in the it's in the MOD records, the mm -hmm. letter that he that he sent to the MOD. Um, but he doesn't give many details because his mother didn't know them either, and his grandfather wouldn't give any details away either. So, mm -hmm. it's I'm loath to say that the story is false, but there's not enough information to go on. Um, and also, that late in the war. Churchill would have heard a lot more stories because there'd been lots of instances before then mm -hmm. of these kind of things. And this is why I don't think this story is actually true. Right, um, yeah. Not least the fact that this scientist never came forward afterwards to actually talk about it. He never right, came out sure. in the open. He never got any, any further information. And this is why I don't think it's actually, it's actually I think it's a bit of a bogus story. You know, but there'd been, the, there'd, been the po there'd been the Polish incident where a, a light had been fired at and nothing happened. There'd been two mm -hmm. other instances during 1943 where fighter aircraft had shot at UFOs. But if, when you read my book, you will find that the same thing happened throughout 1944 from bombers um, in uh, flying over Germany from Britain, but also ones who were based in Italy flying over the Balkans. Mm -hmm. They were seeing things le nearly every night, and they, they were you know, opening fire at these things as well. And then right, if you sure. got into 1944, this is actually to, just to quickly answer a question that was in the chat by John, uh, who actually I know on Twitter. Um, he was mentioning about the Measure 262, the jet fighter. Um, now, even before that was actually introduced as a proper weapon uh, in January 1945, 
the RAF were seeing these things flying around and they were reporting them, seeing them at night in October and even earlier. And they were shooting, they said they were shooting at them as well. So there was all these stories about these strange lights and things that were being fired at. And Churchill, that he would have known at some stage if that had been the case, sure. these reports would have been passed to him. So I, I don't quite believe that something as late as that in the war would have grabbed his attention in the way that this story suggests that he did. Um, I think that if that had been the case, he would have come up with this kind of action much earlier in the war because it was already known that there were strange things flying around. Not only did the RAF intelligence people knew there were odd things that they couldn't explain, but also, the, as you say, the US Army Air, uh, Army Air Force had the same problem, not just in the, in the nighttime, but also in the daytime. They were seeing some really odd things, which are, again, in the records. Now, a lot of these things were actually getting passed to the Air Ministry because it was a, it was a free flow of information between the services. And you can see all these reports where, especially from the RF side that I've read, but also mm -hmm. from the American ones, where you see the other, you know, the other Air Force's information as well. So, And this information got passed up the chain. So if it was, if it was interesting enough and it was dangerous enough, you know, the Germans, because everything would lend towards the Germans have these. These are German weapons. Right. Germans they didn't think about weapons. aliens. They didn't think about UFOs. Right. That wasn't in their lexicon. These must have been German secret weapons. Mm -hmm. And that would have got Churchill's attention because everything else along that line, the rockets, the V1, everything else along those lines did get his attention. And he spent hours and hours and hours with his experts and his scientists trying to work out ways to defeat them. So, there's reasons why I don't think that story is actually true, and nothing mm -hmm. ever has ever come out against it uh, about it afterwards. So I think it's a bit of a, a kind of a red herring, but yeah, it, it does appear everywhere, and people ask right. me all the time about it's it. Book. But I'm, um, I'm a bit sort of, mm, I'm a bit sort of, you know, about it. I'm afraid. The thing I like about the story though was um, that he, um, or whoever made it up, uh, he thought that. You know, spotting a, a a a really good picture of something that mm. was not out of this earth, you know, would re affect all our religions. You know, um, yeah. that's quite a leap, but you know, it's 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 probably true. It's at probably that time, true, you know, at that time, at, it could have been. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I it's mean, uh, you know, these days, you know, who knows what would happen? But mm. um, you know, I thought that was just a, it was it was an unusual place for someone to go to. You know, that to yeah. that kind of leap. So uh, when we did the book, UFOs in War Time, there's probably about 300 different stories in there. And uh, we got to about 20 of them where, you know, we were just thinking like Graham, you know, is this really happened Did this? But they're just too good not to put in there, you know, and that was one of them. I'll certainly mention it in the book. Um, I, I do go at length and I do quote from the official Min Ministry of Defense uh, archives about the letter that he wrote, uh, this this grandson, uh, and all the things that it entails. So if the, if people read my book, they can see the whole story uh, as it's laid out. In terms of photographs, yeah, cool. I mean, you're talking about photographs, Mark. Um, there's not many um, from World War II that stand any kind of scrutiny whatsoever, sure. even the Japanese uh, on, in the Pacific War. All the ones that are online, that one you showed before, is actually a model because Mustangs ah. never never carried never carried weapons like that. They look like bazookas, um, <laughs> for one thing. That that's a complete mock-up. Um, mm -hmm. But the the photographs that appear. You know, they've got no provenance. They've got no dates behind them. They've got no locations. They've got sure. nothing behind them. You can't work out where they were taken in what context. And to me, uh, even though I've written a book about why I believe there was something to this, I don't necessarily believe that any of the photographs actually do show anything because they could well be, you know, photographic defects or, or problems with the developing or just like flak bursts or anything like that. There's a whole sure, lot right. of things that could be. I don't, I've never come across anything that, to me, looks yeah, that I can't explain. There right. are, however, stories of photographs being taken, but the photographs have never surfaced. I'll just give you one story about that, if, I, if you don't mind. There was an anti-submarine aircraft over the Bay of Biscay, and this was November 1942. Uh, this is just after the Americans had sent aircraft to Britain to get involved in the war. Um, and it was actually U.S. Army Air, uh, Air Force aircraft rather than U.S. Navy aircraft that were mm -hmm. involved in this operation. Uh, the U.S. Navy hadn't actually got their act together in terms of aircraft at that time in Europe. Um, so this B-24 bomber, and it was, an, it was an Army Air Force bomber, was flying over the Bay of Biscay with a crew on board and looking for German submarines off the coast of France. And again, an object started trailing their aircraft. And this time it was an object because it was in the daytime. 
And a tech sergeant on board the aircraft took a picture, or he took six pictures of this object. Apparently, one was supposed to be a really good one, but that picture has never come out. It's <laughs> never, ever appeared anywhere. Unfortunately, the, the, the tech sergeant actually died in a raid about three, weeks later, uh, three months later, so mm -hmm. nobody after the war could question him. He never came forward. But that story, you know, exists. Uh, it was the first anti-submarine anti squadron. It was called, or the 361 Bomb Group, I believe. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's a, that's a that's a story that can be chased down. Um, the, the 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 witness came forward, but he only ever gave his initials. He lived in the New York area. The tech sergeant came from the mm -hmm. Pittsburgh area. Um, uh, but that's really all that's known about this story. There's, I've tried to find the official records from the squadron, but the, the, they're not located in the archives in, in America. I've never been able to trace them. Mm -hmm. when, and let me, I'll just jump in uh, real quick again, is that while we're talking about this, we should just talk about a little bit about what was happening in the Pacific. Now, basically, the way it goes is that the European theater of World War II was an army show, and the Pacific theater was more of a Navy show, more of an ocean-going kind of war. And um, even though at the end of World War II, the um, Air Force – kind of released, you know, what they had, you know, on uh, basically, you know, it was just lights and suspected secret weapons, whatever. The Navy never released their files on this to this day. Now, I know this from our mutual friend Keith Chester's book, and which makes it, but, there were, but people saw, you know, strange things in the sky over the Pacific War just as much as they did in Europe. But it's mm -hmm. just that they never had that kind of foundation of uh, the Navy releasing its files, which makes it kind of interesting these days because what's going on with the Tic Tac uh, videos and everything, it, it seems like the Navy has been on the forefront of getting this whole idea that, hey, now we're going to look into these things, uh, you know, past Congress, you know. The Navy has always kind of um, taken a back seat and not been involved as much as the Air Force has in, in the American UFO history, if I can use that term. Um, so I, once again, I think it's odd that now all of a sudden they're the ones, they're the ones and the, they're the tip of the arrow trying to get Congress to spend money to find out what these Tic Tac videos were. And, and, and they succeeded, you know, so now they're going to, they've opened an office to look into this. Congress has funded the money. It's the it's the only like bipartisan bill passed, you know, for in two years or something. Um, so it might be interesting. And if something happens, we get the Navy to thank. Yeah, I, I want to just expand a little bit on that. You know, Lieutenant or ex-Lieutenant retired, uh, I believe he's retired, Ryan Graves. Um, you know, he mentions that they're out there, you know, since like 2015. He's a Navy pilot, F-18 and he's saying that they're seeing these things every day. All the time. Yeah. Um, you know, which is, is quite amazing. And so that being said, you know, the number one thing, it goes all the way back to the Foo Fighters. Like, what is it? This, it, whose technology is this? It's just it's kind of surprising that it hasn't been, like, on the forefront all the way along, all the way back since right. the Foo Fighters. You know, it's kind of, like, tucked away and I forgotten agree. about. It, it, so the people like here. Yeah. I was going to say the whole idea of UFOs from Foo Fighters up till present, when you really think about it, if, um, you know, someone discovers that what these things are, and obviously then it's not going to be some kind of very simple explanation, um, it's going to be earth shattering. It's going to be one of the greatest revelations in human history. Um, you know, if we find out these things are from outer space or another time or different dimension, who knows what, something we maybe can't even understand. So exactly. why aren't UFOs yeah. like the number one story on CNN every day? Why is it on, you know, why is this ridicule factor is still in place? It's, it's you know, people laugh at these things, especially it's on the news. Stick, it's, it's easy you to know? stick your head in the sand and just pretend it doesn't happen. I, I guess. But to me, because I used to work in the media, I, you have to think there's so many people who are interested in UFOs. If you had a UFO story on the front page of the you know, New York Times every day, or if you had a UFO five minutes every day on CNN, it would be huge. It'd be huge. I, I don't understand why it isn't a bigger story, though these Tic Tac videos, you know, were, you know, were bigger than most. But the day that I saw that, the, just real quick, the day that I actually saw the Tic Tac videos was on uh, ABC Morning News, Good Morning America, and they showed it. 
and they come back and and and, and I hate to use this phrase, but the bubble headed news chick goes, Oh, I think I saw the Millennium Falcon and everyone laughs. Okay. And and you don't realize, hey, you might be looking at like the greatest discovery in humankind here. And then it turns out that ABC is owned by Walt Disney, and there was a Star Trek movie came out that week, and it might have been tied in. Who knows? But I think it's um, easy. I think it's easier sometimes when you don't understand what's going on to laugh it off. To laugh um, it I off. Think that's, yeah. an instinct, that's an instinctive reaction. But you have to remember back in '47, even when everything kicked off again after the war, the same. You know, the, the, the official, the um, United States Air Force officials who were in charge of looking at stuff, and the, even see, and, and more senior officers were the, pretty much the same people who'd been in charge at the end of World War Two. You know, with mm-hmm. a few exceptions. So they were going through the same thing again because they'd already gone through this um, thing where um, information about the Foo Fighters and other associated phenomenon was going up the chain of command as to say, you know, what's going on. Um, so if I go back to that list of um, sightings that uh, the, the intelligence officer from the 415th Night Fighter Squadron passed mm-hmm. up the chain of command. He actually passed it to his uh, to his senior, his commanders at the 64th uh, Fighter Wing. They didn't know what to do with it. Uh, they basically said, well, you're going to have to give us more information. So it ended up him bypassing um, that intermediate chain of command, and he went straight to 12th Tactical Air, uh, Air Command, which was the next one up the chain. And that's when that they started talking to each other. But even they didn't have a clue. And they kept saying, well, you're going to have to provide more information again. So it was backwards and forward for, over the course of about two months, sure. over mm-hmm. sort of the end of January, beginning of, uh, or through February, and even into March 1945. There was this toing and froing of letters and memos going backwards and forwards between the squadron and two links up the chain, trying to work out what the hell was going on. It right, got sure. to the point where 12th Tactical Air Command just washed their hands of it and said, we're going to give it, we're going to give it to the Air Ministry in London. And that's to us, the Brits, mm-hmm. uh, because they didn't have a clue. And the, the Air Ministry um, looked at it, and they consulted various officials. And you can see the, the, uh, in my book, I've got, a, I've got a, a copy of the letter. I've got the transcript of the letter. And it basically says, in essence, we don't know what's going on. They're just probably meshed to make two jet fighters. <laughs> which is a, a an aircraft that the Germans sure, yeah, yeah. Aircraft, the Germans yep. failed it, um, and that's and that was effectively washing their hands of it. You know, it's, we don't know. It's not really doing much damage. Nobody's right. getting shot down by them. Uh, water, you know, it's, not, it's not losing the war for us. Yep. So let's just bury it. Yep. Yep. So did they yeah. did they display extraordinary, you know, navigation yep. like yeah, they did. Like what they, they didn't show up on radar, first of all, because the, these things were sitting off the wingtips of air of night fighters, which were equipped with the best re- and air, airborne intercept radar that the Allies could field at that time. It's actually better than the German stuff. Um, so you know, the the P sixty one Black Widows and the Bristol Bow Fighters, that the two American night fighter units in in France and Belgium, and also the two that were based in Italy. They all have the same sort of aircraft, and that was a pretty good radar system. It was actually a copy of a, of a British one, but never mind. Uh, but it was it was really good, and we had air, we had mosquito night fighters, we had uh, bow fighter night fighters as well, and they were coming up with the same problem. These things were sitting off wingtips or, or being seen in the distance, but and the radar on board the aircraft had a range of about five to eight miles. It just wasn't seeing them at all. And there's one story of one of the American night fighter pilots after an encounter with one of these lights. He, he radioed one of the ground radar stations to say, "Have you got it?" And the the reply was, "It's just you up there." Mm, you know, so right. th- this is what happened. So they they had some kind of anti radar property, but they were extremely fast when they wanted to be. They were very maneuverable, and everything that you read about now, you know, about what they can do, they did back then. So right. it's just a, this kind of le- you know extra leap in technology that they displayed was much better than even the best jets and the rocket fighters and all the rest of it from the war. Sure. Whereas nowadays they're better than the best aircraft we can put up. So, the, you know, there's this kind of step change in what they display. Um, mm-hmm. Of course, back then, as I said before, the allies thought these things were German serial weapons. Now there is this kind of school of thought that the Germans thought the same thing. Now it's all great saying that, but trying to prove it is a different matter entirely. Mm-hmm. And I'm yet to come across official German documents that say that. that is the case. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence to say right, that yeah. the Germans saw these, but finding German cases and German pilots who saw them 
you know, there's one chapter in my book, but it's not very big. It's only, what, 20 pages, maybe 30 pages. And I've, it's got all the stories I can find. And I've gone through some fairly obscure German and Austrian publications to try and find those. Um, but they do exist, but there are not many of them. And in most cases, there's not much information that you can check out. And I do, and I used to, I would do that. I would look at the units involved, find out where they were based. And you don't even get that information with a lot of these. So even then, some of these stories are a little bit suspect. A lot of them come out of French authors from the 1960s and 1970s. Uh -huh. A lot of books back then published these things. Mm -hmm. And actually, one of the authors made a story up about a German <laughs> research program about UFOs in the war. It was called oh, Sonderville yeah, yeah. 13. Mm -hmm. He made that story up in the 1970s, in 19, actually in a book he wrote in 1970 called The Black Book of Flying Saucers because he wanted to expose people who were plagiarizing his work. Sure. He, also, he also made up another story about UFOs in the same book to try and catch them out. Now, people believe those, and you still mm -hmm. see it today. So there are stories you've got to, you've got to take with a pinch of salt. <laughs> they might be in my book. I better go back and check. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know, a, a lot of these things, like you're talking about, Graham, they almost become like considered a fact. Oh, they do, For instance, yeah. Alexander the Great. There, you know, everyone says, "Oh, Alexander Shining the Great had a yeah. UFO sighting," but that came out in a 1955 uh, book, and there's no, you can't go back any further than that. So, yeah, that's true. In these things, so, yeah, they so go on those, from, you know, they, they become, they do, yeah, they become established facts, even though they're nothing of the sort. Right. In that exactly. book, with these, most of these cases, I've gone back as far as I can to try and find where the origin, of, the origin of the actual the cases are when they're not in official records, because there are some which lie outside the official records, and you do trace them back to the same old sources. So, um, you know, part of the book I talk about the German flying discs, and I talk about um, the flak mines that uh, Renato Vesco uh, made up effectively. But both of those things are now established fact. But again, there's nothing, there's no truth in any of them because sure, when right. you boil them back to their start, the origins. The, the discs start with a whole load of, well, about four or five different people who started putting things in newspapers in the early 1950s. Mm -hmm. And you can't go any further back than that. Now, they say they were engineers or they say they worked for Albert Speer's Ministry of Armaments, but you can't check that anywhere because there's no documentation to say they ever existed. Uh, never mind, you know, in, in terms of what they did, never mind that they built discs. So, you know, and there would have been a paper trail for this kind of thing. They were, you know, the Germans were very good at bureaucracy. They had right, paper trails for everything, you, you know, bet. getting materials, getting a manpower, getting research facilities, all this kind of stuff. There would have been evidence. They wouldn't right. have destroyed everything. It, it wasn't that simple. Even the right, things right. that they tried to destroy during the war still survived. So I can't believe that a disc project would ever have been subject to the same kind of you know scrutiny and would have been this extra level of secrecy and all the rest of it, yada, yada, yada. Um, so that, I just don't believe it. And I go into quite, like there's three chapters in the book about the discs and about these things. Uh, there's one called Fireball and one called Kugelblitz that this, this Italian author called Renato Vesco came up with. He came up with in the 50s, but he published his book in the end of 1968, I think it was. Um, and it's called Intercept, Don't Shoot. And he postulated, it, or he actually stated rather, that these two um, unmanned, they were like kind of spheres, and they would be attracted by the um, exhaust signatures from Allied bombers, and they would either like interfere with the engines, um, mm -hmm. you know, and shoot them down that way. But these mm -hmm. things never existed because sure. his when his footnotes and his books talk about a lot of things in the war, and they're great and the things that everybody understands and knows about. But when he talks about these partic two particular weapons, all his sources run dry. You can't find anywhere where he talks about them. He yeah, says yeah. he got them from Allied reports, mm -hmm. and he mentions the reports that he says he got them from. Now, I've looked at those reports. I can't find anything. So, again, that's something else that you know I don't believe in. But if you look across the internet and you look and you put in to put a search in for the Foo Fighters, sooner or later you'll come across Cool Blitz or Fireball, or the German discs, or mm -hmm. or both. And mm -hmm. but none of them are true, you know. Right. And it, or, or if they are. I've yet to see the evidence for them. See, that's the problem. I think that that's the problem with um, UFO books across the board, but especially these books that people come out with who um, we we're talking off here, Martin, about this, how uh, you know, the Germans had uh, help from aliens and, uh, you know, they had a base on the moon and they had a base in Antarctica. And, the uh, bell, and something bell, right? 
uh, the bell, the bell you know, with the time. Yes. And you see, the, the, what, what the problem with that is, is that, you know, in, in my opinion, is that um, it furthers this idea that the Nazis were supermen. And, um, you know, that's just not a good, uh, you know, train of thought these days, okay? And you have to ask yourself, if you choose to believe this, if you choose to believe that they had a base on the moon, that they were, you know, in touch with a planet 40 uh, light years from Earth and they were helping them with their secret weapons and so on, uh, why did they lose the war? Exactly. You know, I mean, just, just ask yourself that question. With all this unbelievable extraterrestrial help, why would they lose the war? Why were they building their ME-262 jet fighters with um, plywood uh, cockpits? Because they didn't have enough metal. You know, does this sound like a, a super army of supermen who are getting help from aliens and so on? Of course, the, the Allies thought that the Germans were, were sort of not quite supermen, but they thought they had advanced weapons, which they did. But all the way through the intelligence reports, not just on the RF side, but also on the American side, you see these references to, you know, what weapons are these? What German weapons are these? Mm-hmm. Now, right. the, the German, and they, they attribute them to early types of service to air missile or mm-hmm. to the, the jets that, that Max just referred to. But actually, when you look at the history, and this is something I used to be really interested in, so I, I can speak with some authority on the, on the issue. Um, the missile projects, they started developing them in 1943, but they had problems with the guidance systems. They had problems with the rocket motors and mm-hmm. everything in between. And they never managed to field an operational service-to-air missile, mm-hmm. even at the end of the war. They had plans to put one into, into production, but it never it never went ahead. Yeah, but yet these things were being seen as early as, as, as 1942. They were mm-hmm. calling them rockets. So, And the, the Germans had about 50 different types of missile in development during the war. Right. Um, but there was only one or two that were actually successful. They had a TV guided bomb. There was a couple of anti, there was a couple of uh, air-to-air missiles that nearly got into into service. So uh, and there was a few air-to-service missiles as well. Um, mm-hmm. But they were and you see in the intelligence records that some of these are mentioned, but none of them could have done the kind of maneuvers or the performance that the the, the Foo Fighters and these other objects that were being seen on a regular basis right, could sure. have carried out. And, mm-hmm. And then you talk about the jets and also the rocket aircraft that the Germans had. Now, the the Germans fielded both the Measurement 163 Comet, the the rocket fighter, and also the Measurement 262, the jet fighter, in the summer of 1944. Now, as far as nighttime was concerned, the Comet never flew at night because it was too dangerous to fly in the day. Mm -hmm. And the the 262 only came into service in January. And the first two-seaters, the proper night fighter, at the end of March 1945, right before the end of the war. And yet the Allies were seeing these aircraft, or they said they were reporting seeing them, as early as September and October 1944, at night. And and there's actually bits in the archives when you can see through the squadron reports, you'll see um, reports of gunners saying they shot these down. So Hmm. there's all these reports of, well, what actually were they shooting down then? Because they weren't night fighters. And yet these things were basically just described as as really quick-moving lights, very fast-moving mm-hmm. lights with very little mm-hmm. form behind them. So, wow. Interesting. Okay. Well, it's time for us to go into break. We have a three-minute music break. So hang in there. We'll be right back um, over at KGRA Radio. We'll be right back right after these messages. And hang in on YouTube for the music break. UFOs are found in Renaissance art, on ancient coins, and etched on cave walls. They're even reported in the Bible. But more surprising is when UFOs are seen the most in times of war. Through centuries, thousands of UFO sightings have been made by high-ranking officials, military pilots, and ordinary soldiers. Often, these fantastic appearances occur at the height of great battles. From World War I to D-Day to Korea, Vietnam, and beyond, military investigators are baffled. Why do UFO sightings spike so drastically during wartime? Could it be mistaken aircraft, or is someone, or something, looking in on us? In UFOs in wartime, what they didn't want you to know, Mac Maloney chronicles centuries of these incredible sightings and tries to solve the puzzle of why so many UFOs are seen while humanity is at war. Read about the scare ships, the ghost planes, and the ghost rockets, alien giants in the jungles of Vietnam, UFOs controlling our ICBM bases, dogfights with flying saucers during the Gulf War, and more. 300 pages of unbelievable stories, along with many startling photographs. That's UFOs in Wartime, 
What They Didn't Want You to Know by Mac Maloney. On sale at your local bookstore or on Amazon.com. We've all heard of Area 51, the U.S. government's top secret base in the Nevada desert. But have you ever heard of Area 52 or 53 or 54? 54? 54? How about Tonopah Test Range or the Navy's secret base inside the Bermuda Triangle? Find out about them and more in Mac Maloney's Beyond Area 51, Mysteries of the World's Most Forbidden Places. Did Richard Nixon show Jackie Gleason a crashed alien spaceship near the swamps of Florida? Is it true that more UFOs are seen over a small Scottish village than anywhere else in the world? And is there a secret place in Russia that some people think is heaven on earth? In Mac Maloney's Beyond Area 51, you'll visit more than a dozen top secret places around the globe. The haunted forests of New Jersey. A valley in Colorado where shadows come alive and humans can fly without wings. And where's the only secret base in America that's not been visited by UFOs? You've heard Mac talk all about these places on his radio show. Now you can read all about them yourself. That's Mac Maloney's Beyond Area 51, Mysteries of the World's Most Forbidden Places. Now on sale at Amazon. Hey fans, Lois Lane here, and I think it's time for you to get some free swag from Mac Maloney's Military Exile show. We have badges, pins, bar coasters, and some very cool 3D show logos that we just can't wait to give away. Just go to MacMaloney.com and hit the contact button. Send us an email with your mailing address, and we'll ship the free swag out to you quicker than Switch can eat breakfast. That's MacMaloney.com, and hit the contact button to get your free swag today. Requests for tasteful news of Wanwan will be handled on a case-by-case basis. Welcome back to the show. Uh, my guest tonight is Graham uh, Randall, and I have uh, Mac Maloney helping me out. I love facts. Uh, this guy is really good. Um, he has his facts down, and I'm really enjoying the show a lot. I hope you are, too. And bringing Mac back in. Mm-hmm. And Graham, uh, I'm really enjoying this so far. So we have about, just to let you know, a half, half hour in, we're going to be popping up the uh, phone number. And people can call in if they'd like to. But before we get right back into this, this uh, question came up early on. And uh, uh, David wanted to know, did you see this has to do with aviation? That's the only reason he was asking this question, because he knows you like aviation. So you didn't see this particular. Uh, Sorry, David. I didn't didn't catch up with that. Yep. No problem. Um, So uh, I know there are some other there are some other questions here. And please, if you are going to post questions in chat, please use all caps so I don't I don't miss it. And I don't even know where we were exactly. Um, you know, I tell you what, I'll, I, I'll I talk a bit about the end of war if I can um, about the trying you know, the, whether we're trying to search for these because there was a big uh, push um, even before the Allies invaded Europe. They had they'd already organized a system where they were going to look through whatever they captured in Germany when they finally defeated Germany to what they would find in terms of technology, because obviously they knew they had jet fighters, rocket fighters, you know, rockets and other types of things. Well, because there were, there were advances in dentistry in, in pharmaceuticals, everything mm-hmm. they were going to exploit. So they had this system called, well, SIOS for the British side and, and uh, uh, BIOS for the British side and SIOS for the, for the American side. And it was a combined intelligence um, objectives subcommittee. That was what SIA stood for. So, and they had regular meetings before D-Day to say what they were going to do. And then when we started going through Europe, um, started going through France and Belgium and and Holland and into Germany, they knew where things were. They knew facilities. They knew factories that they would Mm -hmm. target. They would send people out to start with to grab them, to seize them, to stop them being destroyed, to Mm -hmm. hold on to scientists and other people, to get paperwork, all this kind of thing. So there was teams of people fanning out all over Germany um, at the end of the war, British, American, they were looking for technology, aircraft, weapons, rockets, yep. anything, you name it. Yep. 
Now, these the, the actual um, update and the progress reports from these teams and from this work is in the records. You can find it. You can actually search in the uh, Air Force Historic, uh, Historic Records Agency in Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama. You can you know you can get the information through them. Uh, that's where I got mine from. And you can look through all these SIOS and BIOS reports to see what they were looking at at the end of the war. And you know, there's hundreds and thousands of pages of it all. But I've gone through a lot of it, mm -hmm. and, and you can see the kind of developments that the Germans were doing. Now, at the time, they were say, they were going through the rubble of German a aviation industry and the weapons plants and all the rest of it, and they didn't find anything that re remotely resembled sure. what these things were doing during the war. Not that just the lights in the nighttime, but the objects they were seeing in the daytime as well, because they weren't just lights at night. They were seeing structured craft and things mm -hmm. that were a bit, a bit more ephemeral as well during the day. But mm -hmm. nothing ever came of what they were looking for. And right. the Russians did the, the same, um, presumably. The Russians had their own, you know, they had a name for their teams, and they were doing exactly sure. the same in their sphere, but they never found anything at all. No one found anything. I mean, the Germans did have a TV-guided bomb, okay, now. Henshin um, 293. You know, and, and, and think about that. that this is in the mid-40s, or you know, 44 or so. It sank at least one ship in the Mediterranean. Now, just think about that for a second. They actually had a TV camera in the nose of a bomb, and they it was launched from an aircraft, and they, you know, they guided it to its target on the ground. They didn't work all the time. It was very kind of hard to work with, obviously. It was um, kind of primitive technology, but, hey, you know, it's still good when you think about technology-wise yeah. in the 40s having the TV-guided bomb. But that that was almost like the peak of, you know, their technology. That was, that was really, really up there, okay, to – to, you know, fall for these stories that, you know, people saw flying saucers shooting down B-17s during the raids on Shinefoot and stuff like that. And it, you, you that's just, an interesting you story, Mark, because that's about the, yeah, that's the, that's the show right, of little black you know? discs story. And, and the people who write these things and who go out and lecture about them and make movies about them, I, I think they should be ashamed of themselves. It's a <laughs> disgrace to kind to, <laughs> you know, try to, you know, keep fomenting this. As Graham said, you know, just look down the line, how many sources, you know, uh, uh, were involved in these things. And, and they always proved to be dead ends. Yeah. Um, and little, that's just little, like my, my personal bugaboo. I really yeah. don't like this whole idea that, uh, you know, the Nazis had all these great weapons. And you mentioned little it. black discs. And that, that, that definitely exists in terms of a report that definitely exists in the 384th Bomb Group uh, archives. Um, and they was all like kind of hockey puck sized uh, black objects mm -hmm. that fell on a, on a raid of bombers um, and supposed to have maybe burned the wing of one of them. So there may have been some kind of incendiary weapon that was dropped by a German aircraft. There was certainly mm -hmm. experiment with cable, with cable attached bombs and also other things. This is probably some kind of field modification, but that's sort of gone into the lore of UFOs and, and Foo Fighters mm -hmm. as well. Um, but some of the more esoteric things like you know, the Zeppelin type size objects right. that were seen and they were seen in Eastern Europe as well um, over the Russian battlefields they were seen in Romania and some other places Right. so now, yeah, you can't really fine. account for those because they're huge mm -hmm. um, but also the Black Triangles as well over, over Northumberland and England can't account for them so easily and there's a whole load of other things as well um, and even these things that look like jets but weren't actually jets uh, mm -hmm. that, were, that were displaying the kind of jet characteristics, but were flying long before the Germans managed to field them at night. Mm -hmm. You know, those mm -hmm. are something else that can't be explained. So there's a whole load of things going on in the war. And actually, if you go for earlier back, so you go to 41, 42, 43, and the reports from back then, they definitely can't be jets and rocket aircraft because the Germans were still trying to perfect them at that time, and they wouldn't have even been able to fly them at night. So you can't readily write off a lot of things as to be German secret weapons. Um, I'd just like to make a plea before I go any further, if you don't mind. If anybody out there does have any documentation from the yeah, German sure. side about yeah. what you know, what they were seeing, then I'd love to see it. Send it to Graham, yeah. Said, please send it Absolutely. Through, please. I'd love to see it. Um, but it, you know that, that's the side of things that is a bit weak. Um, it is is the Axis side, is the Italian Air Force, is the German Air Force, and even to a certain extent the Russians as well. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the Russians are really secretive, even after the war as well, for obvious reasons. So their documents are few and far between. When you look at their reports from the war, the things they said they saw, there's a lot to lead, you know, left to be desired in terms of the reporting, in terms of units that just don't exist. You can't find out which units these airmen belong to. Um, the aircraft they were flying on, uh, when they saw these craft 
again, you know, that's a bit suspect. So you have to take them with a pitch of salt as well, I'm afraid. Um, you know, the uh, the story about the Raider in uh, Los Angeles in uh, early 1942, um, in February 42, they made uh, 1941 was uh, 1942 was a movie that was made by um, Steven Spielberg. But this actually happened in the middle of February, um, a couple months after Pearl Harbor. Um, people, you know, saw uh, on radar, uh, a lot of military and also less press saw this large formation of, you know, lights uh, going over Los Angeles. Uh, Los Angeles at the time was a weapons center, especially Burbank. So they had anti-aircraft um, batteries there, f- shot at these things for hours. It, so much uh, shrapnel came down that six people were killed on, on the ground. Well, some um, of them were heart attacks. Or heart attacks, too, as well. And there's a, there's a picture that was taken by the um, Los Angeles Times. I know that because they charged me 500 bucks to put it in my book. But, you know, that thing, it looks like a flying saucer. That's an actual photograph. And um, they determined that this thing might be two to 300 feet in length. Um, it, and, and at the time, everyone just assumed, oh, oh, this is Japanese launching these things off the aircraft carriers, whatever. You know, once again, it was one of these anecdotal stories at the end of the war that the Japanese admiral said, you know, it, it wasn't us. Whoever was doing it, it wasn't us. You might have thought it was us. But even if that is not true, we just know for a fact that the Japanese did not have the technology to, to sail an aircraft carrier past Hawaii, never mind have one off the coast of California. David, um, David so, Marler does a good presentation. There's a, there's a good presentation he did on YouTube, yes. um, and you can find mm-hmm. it if you look hard enough for it, about the, the Battle of Los Angeles. The thing right. about the craft, that craft, it's the same as about the, 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 the Polish Wellington that uh, tried to shoot that light. If that had been some kind of craft, it would have been shot down. They fired mm-hmm. 1,400 rounds of anti-aircraft shells at it. You know, So you, you would have done some damage to it at least. It would have been brought down if it had been anything um, right. you know, man-made. So what the hell was it? It wasn't a balloon because it would be too flimsy right. for that kind of firepower. Wouldn't have been an aircraft either. Um, so you know, nobody really knows what the what that particular what object happened, right? was. But again, that's just a precursor to what happened afterwards. The Polish Wellington, um, the instant that that's on, on the book I've got behind me there, that happened exactly a month later. But there've mm-hmm. been other things. Um, pr- there's hints in the intelligence records that I've looked at, and I'm still looking at at the moment, um, which talk about things following bombers throughout late 1940 into Mm -hmm. 1941. And this is the RF I'm talking about here. And they've got this detailed analysis where they see these lights that are following them and they think they're night fighters, but then they can't work out what type of aircraft's involved, which is quite strange. But also Mm -hmm. some of the aircraft are followed for 250 miles and they're Mm -hmm. followed towards their targets. Now I can almost understand why you might want to follow an aircraft back to its base Right. Then the Germans would know that anyway. They had pretty good intelligence. They were photographing our airfields before the war. Um, but also, the idea was that you'd shoot an aircraft down before it bombed your cities. And that was mm-hmm. the whole idea of the German sure, fire sure. force. So why were these things falling? But even better still, why the hell do they have lights on? You know, the idea, if you're a night fighter yes. pilot, the last thing you want to do is have something that says, here I am, shoot right. me down. You know, right, yeah. so it, it just didn't make any sense whatsoever. But... The RAF, well, they call it the Operational Research Section. It was part of Bomber Command. It was their, part of their intelligence analysis. And they looked at this problem for months in, 19, in late 1941 and early 1942. Um, and they did, you can see these reports, month after month, they have these tables of numbers of aircraft involved and whether it was lights following them or it was unknown aircraft, all this kind of stuff. And they never got the bottom of it. They just couldn't fathom it out. And they got to a point in sort of mid to late 1942 where they went, enough's enough. We spent all this time on trying to work it out, and we can't. Mm. Um, so we're stopping this. But about mm-hmm. two or three months later, they kicked it off again because it was still going on. And they spent about another couple of months, and you can see the reports for those as well. And then they finally just called it a day because they weren't getting anywhere. These lights weren't doing anything hostile. They weren't right. shooting the bombers down. They, right. weren't, they couldn't work out what they were. They had no purpose and yet they were still happening. But there have been fighter pilots that have been fo- um, followed back from cross-channel raids as well um, in 1942, which had lights following them as well. So, the, the, you know, it wasn't just the bombers. Um, you know, intruder uh, fighter pilots were, were having the same problems as well. There's lots of different stories. Right. And contemporary yeah. to the time, you know, during that time, um, was there ever a suggestion that they could be something 
not from this world somehow? No. Never? No. No. It, it no. was never on the lexicon. So everything was couched in the terms of German secret weapons. Right. You have to remember back then, there was only a few, you know, not many people were interested in science fiction. Yes, there were publications, yet there were pulp magazines, there were novels, but it wasn't as big as it would become in the golden age of the 50s. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there was only a few people. Uh, everybody just leapt to the conclusion that they must be German secret weapons. Right. I can't speak for the Axis reaction because, again, we're hampered by the lack of documentation and actual reports the germans obviously for for great, good reason didn't want to talk about the war straight after the war and mm -hmm. so that's why you don't have the number of people who came forward to talk about their experiences um and i've yet to actually come across any proper pilot reports you know uh, that bear any kind of scrutiny so we're hampered from that side again it's all anecdotal but in terms of the RAF experience and the and the United States Army Air Force experience, yeah, they they, they saw things, but they just wrote them off as being German secret weapons. Right, that's yeah. definitely true of the intelligence reporting, and that's in black and white. You can read that for yourself. Mm -hmm. Did they ever destroy? Did the Germans ever destroy any of their wartime documents? Oh yeah, they they they, they had a big policy of destroying stuff. There's a whole there's a whole year of information that went um, when they had a big purge on it just before the end of the war. They were trying to destroy things left, right, and center. They tried to destroy prototypes of aircraft. They were quite successful in some respects, but mm -hmm. there was always something left. There, there was aircraft that they tried to destroy by burying them in tunnels um, or, or just like getting rid of them. But actually, the Allies still found them or found documentation on them. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the weird, weird and wonderful stuff, like the vertical takeoff rocket interceptor called the the, the natter um mm -hmm. it's got fully it's fully documented it, it, there's actually pictures there's video there's everything uh, not video there's film there, there's everything about it even the the designer you know is on record about talking about it so a lot of these things were really hard to actually kill off in terms of getting rid of every scrap of knowledge about them um mm -hmm. so that's why i find it very hard to believe that th esoteric stuff like the discs or these aerial flak mines ever existed and the germans certainly didn't build the foo fighters it was nothing to do with them at all um, right. if it had been it would definitely have been found after the war. There would have been something that would have led the Allies to believe that they had it. They questioned a lot of German scientists. I've got that in my book about the questioning that happened um, and the form of words they used and the people they spoke to and some very, very prominent German aer aeronautic engineers and other scientists, et cetera, et cetera. And, and this went on throughout 1945, but they got nowhere with that as well because the Germans just said, we don't know anything about this. Um, and, and it's, um, I mean, the, the Nazi scientists put uh, the United States on the moon. I mean, a lot of the scientists that they picked up in Operation Paperclip, Werner yeah. von Braun, you know, probably the most famous one of them all. Now, when you think about that, he actually was the um, designer of the largest ballistic missile ever, the Saturn V. If he knew the secrets of UFOs, why would you go down that route, you know? Exactly. Right. Of course, they were talking about the flying wings as well. So there was a, it was a company, well, it was a couple of brothers called Horton, and they built flying wing aircraft before the war. But they also flew, they built them during the war, and they came up with a jet fighter, well, jet fighter bomber actually called the, the it was called the Horton Nine. Mm -hmm. um, and there's stories around the internet that this was the basis of the flying wings and the thing that Kenneth Arnold saw. But actually, that's a bit off as well because. There's also reports that the Russians built fleets of these things as night fighters, and that's mm -hmm. an official CIA reports. Uh, but it's oh, all rubbish as well. So, you know, there was a lot of schools of thought after, straight after the war saying, oh, the Russians must have got a hold of this technology and they must mm -hmm. be developing it. And this is what we're seeing now. But again, that's all just rubbish. Um, and also the fact that and people suggest that Northrop, uh, Jack Northrop, looked at these things as well. Well, he certainly had people examine the, mm -hmm. uh, the 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 V three prototype of the of the Horton uh, jet bomber that uh, the jet uh, fighter bomber rather they brought across to America after the war that he certainly had engineers look at it but they didn't do anything else with it because well it, it never appeared anywhere and he continued to build flying wings afterwards but he never built anything that looked like that so right, you know, these people who think that these were the basis of UFOs I think that sort of barking at the wrong tree. The only strange thing about the Hortons that we're talking about is, real quick, is um, mm. what Kenneth Arnold saw that day, uh, which started the whole flying saucer craze. I mean, if if, if you put together the, this Horton prototype that we were just talking about and what he described, they look kind of the same, you know? It's got a loose, it's got a loose resemblance. But if you remember, I believe the, it was only one of them looked like that. All the rest were heel-shaped. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. He talks yeah. about that. So... It, Again, it's one of these things where these facts are sort of 
propagated into, yeah, that, that this definitely happened. But actually, when you dig a bit deeper, I think you find that the truth is slightly blurred. Um, but that's the same with ufology all over. This is what we have to deal with, don't we? I'll tell you, Graham, you do your homework there, brother. Um, well, I certainly do. Hopefully, it I didn't harder at this than I do. That's for sure. No, I mean, I'm not, I don't want to blow my own trumpet here, but there's 1,100 footnotes in that book. So oh, wow. that's where the do- that's where the information comes from. Oh, I didn't want anybody like five years down the line to say, "Graham, you just made this up." I've mm-hmm. seen, I've read too much. I've read too many books where I've not been able to work out where the author got the information from. Right, and I didn't want to be one of those. So mm-hmm. I, when I set out writing it, I thought, you know, everything I find out, I'm going to let people know so they can do their own research. So if somebody wants to go through my book and find, look, I want to check Graham's sources. I want to check his facts. That they're quite welcome to do that, and mm-hmm. if they that uses if that's a springboard for them to find out other information that I haven't managed to find, that's yeah, great. Right. Yeah, that's the yeah. that's the um, the Horton two two nine or supposedly anyway. And this is what yeah 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 something similar, <laughs> but but yeah yeah I'm really I'm really enjoying the show. So, did any of these Foo Fighters ever display anything that? seemed like it could have been a threat there was certainly well it depends on what you call a threat anything that was flying around in the skies following aircraft was going to be treated as a threat Mm -hmm. so that was just standard practice and they were fired at but in terms of retaliation then nothing that we know about now that doesn't mean saying something was shot down that we don't know about and they all died Mm -hmm. but there's no stories of you know, sort of attacks on anything like that. Um, the nearest you've got are things on collision courses, um, things that may or may not have um, sort of collided with aircraft or, or hit them or things like that. And that show of black discs that Mike was talking about earlier. It's actually a mm-hmm. Stuttgart raid in 1943, but also there's cases in Italy as well where the same phenomenon was seen. Uh, and this was probably some kind of German aerial weapon, probably a, like a, a, an aerial bomb with fragments mm-hmm. coming out of it that was designed to like just interfere with aircraft by falling on them. Um, so I'm not entirely sure that's got anything to do with this particular subject. I've covered it in the book at length, uh, just so people are aware of it. But I think that's probably the nearest you're going to get to any kind of proper threat. Um, but who knows what happened in other countries and who knows about the people who say didn't come back from raids. So it's possible, but we don't know about it. Yeah, there's no dog. I mean, the, the little bit that you know we looked into the Foo Fighters, there was never we could never find anything that had Foo Fighters firing back Ooh. at you know our planes or or anything. It just seemed to me like they were observing. You know, they were observing, and um, you know, uh, one of the things we do in our book is that they might have been time travelers from the future coming back and seeing history being made. World War II, you know, because they seem that. to be observing, you know, looking in on us for some reason. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I get that. That's, that's actually not a bad theory, really. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, I mean, I, if you were if you were to speculate, I mean, if someone was to speculate mm-hmm. what they possibly could be, it's not an outrageous theory. I mean, you can have uh, and Mac, I like what you said earlier. You said maybe we don't even understand or we don't even know um you know what if we if we if it was explained to us we may not even understand what the explanation is right sure that's the thing we uh, we um you know i I use this example sometimes where you know when you see these um tv shows like um national geographic where out in the serengeti or whatever you know the the lions are eating the antelopes and you know killing stuff right things killing things now you know, the film crew is out there watching the lions eat the gazelles and stuff, okay? The, the, the lions are so used to these trucks and safari trucks that, you know, they just walk by them like they're just something else. But see, the, the lions or the gazelles, they can never understand, you know, what those trucks are about, what humans are about, what cameras are about. You know, they don't have the intelligence to understand what is going on. Well, maybe we, we're just a little bit down, further down in the lab than we think we are, and the explanation is something we can't understand just as long, just as just as well as a lion can't understand what a camera is. You know, uh, you know, it, it's a possibility because only because these things have been around for years. We've we've you know we're talking about you know the last century, but let's face it, they've been seen for years and years and years. Okay, but but no one nowhere has ever really come out with okay, this is the explanation. This is 
this is the explanation that even makes sense. Uh, that if anybody, that, if anybody says they're an expert on UFOs, run like hell. It, yeah, right. Maxim There's no starts. such a thing. You know, it, it's a big mystery, and you know, I'm hoping that we find out someday. Um, but uh, you know, again, maybe we just aren't smart enough to comprehend it. Yeah, yeah. this is a. I'm not sure what this is. This was sent to me yesterday. I, I'm trying to. I've been trying to text someone. One over Italy. What's that? It's over Italy, I believe. Oh, you know, you know this particular. I'm sure I've seen that picture before. I think it's over Italy, but I can't remember exactly where and when. Yeah, I was trying to find that out. Um, I had seen that image before too, but I. It looks it looks old, but you know, prior mm-hmm. to the 1940s, I have no idea. No, I think it's more content. I think it's more 1960s and 1970s. I can't say so I can't remember exactly the circumstances where it was taken, but I think it's Italian Air Force. And I think it's in the 60s or maybe the 70s. Hmm. I, I see. I see. Um, as far as, um, you know, the, the Germans going back to them, because that fascinates me. I I think, I mean, do I have this right? Were they the first ones to develop something like the jet engine or was that? Mm, depends. There were certain people mucking about with jet engines in the 1930s. So you had the Italians. They had a kind of mm-hmm. a strange contraption. was part jet engine, part piston engine. Uh, the 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 Germans did invent, and they had a, actually a, a jet engine aircraft flying just before the start of the Second World War in August 1939. We, uh, the Brits also were, were fiddling about with jet engines as early as 1935, 1936. So they did actually have them, and but the Germans were the quickest to exploit them in terms of having an operational weapon. So mm-hmm. they had a jet aircraft in terms of something that could have been used as a weapon flying in about 1941. But it took a while. To, it was protracted in terms of development because in 1941, the Germans thought they'd won the war already. So they'd scaled back a lot of their long term research into things. So it, it, it slowed down. And by the time that you know, they had to sort of speed up again, it was a bit too late. Um, and also Hitler um, decided that the Menschenmeck 262, which was the, the best candidate for fielding a jet, en- uh, jet aircraft, had to be a bomber rather than a fighter. He right. couldn't understand why you know it was better, more suited as, as a fighter. So they had to put bomb racks on it, which slowed it down, which wasn't really suited for. But it was a really good airframe. It just didn't have very good engines. Mm-hmm. Um, they only last maybe thirty hours, and then they would either break or, or had to be so had to be serviced. So they were very crude. And if you actually opened the throttles up too hard, too quickly, they would catch fire. So they were very, very unsafe. But after the the rocket engine uh, aircraft, the the, the 163 Comet, which again people say was an explanation for the Foo Fights, which couldn't have been, but that was even dangerous to fly in the daytime. It had no no undercarriage. It it was launched off a dolly, which was jettisoned after takeoff. The, the, The rocket fuel only lasted about seven minutes. Then it became the world's fastest glider. It could nearly touch Mach 1 in a dive. It was so quick. But when it landed... There was still the fuel on board, and it was two really volatile fuels, one of right. which would actually burst into flames or touch anything organic, which included the pilot. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, my God. T-Stoff and S-Stoff. T-Stoff and C-Stoff, yeah. And they were, um, they were so volatile when they were put together, that's what created the chemical reaction that made the rocket go. But yeah. when they, they would store them at opposite ends of the airfields because they just – had to prevent these two things. The, tanker, the tankers had big T's and C's painted on them, so nobody right, yeah. would spook them. Because if you put one drop of one on the other, it would explode. Explode, oh, yeah, yeah, wow. crazy. That that sounds that sounds frightening. Um, but they never flew those aircraft at night, and this is the thing that I, I do try to uh, um, at pains to explain in the, in the book that a lot of these aircraft were never fielded at the hmm. times they were seen or at all. So they couldn't have been explanations, even though they were put up as explanations, both in the war and afterwards. Right. And even the rockets and, and the missiles that they were trying to develop as well, these were things that were put forward as, as possible explanations by the intelligence people and by the pilots and the aircrew. But again, you know, they're non-starters for the reasons I go into much more at length in the book. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's a crazy time. But the good thing is, and this is the first time there was a lot of documentation that you can look at. So even like 80 years ahead, you know, ahead now, we can look back and actually see the reports that they were writing about what they were seeing. It's not just verbal reports in, in, in you know, dusty documents and, and um, books and handed down by, you know, by verbal account. 
these are actually things in records that you can touch, you can feel, you can read, and it's the first time it happened. But they must have, it must have been a bit of a stigma, really, because they didn't work out what they were. And then two or three years later, the whole thing kicked off again with the flying saucers. Mm-hmm. And you know, they must have just been scratching their heads saying, we're going through this again. You know, what happened, right? We didn't have an answer last time. And it was the same people. Um, General Stanford, you know, the, the guy who um, was at that 1952, um, you know, the, the, the press conference after the Washington um, flying, you know, the source of the radar mm-hmm. contacts, uh, when he stood, when he sat in and said, you know, there's no such thing. He'd been a deputy commander of the 8th Air Force. So he was well aware what, what was going on back then. And yep. then you've got the guy who effectively wrote the memo that shut, shut down uh, Project Blue Book uh, in 1969, the Bollinger Memo. Now, Bollinger, he was actually the CO of one of the night fighter units in Italy that saw these things. And he so saw he his own sighting in 1944. So, yeah. you know, there's links there as well. Yeah. Wow. The question is, is why did they keep it? Why did they choose to lie about it? You know? I mean, you always in hear that very well. They have no way of combating it. I think it's no the same way of now. combating it. We I think they've just got you. no... They've got no defense against them. They've got nothing. There's nothing they can do. If these Some things never change. change. Yeah, exactly. You know, exactly it's, you know, it's, the way it is it's just now. a weird the wheel, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. I mean, some of the things you read from all the way back then are ex- very similar to the things that are coming out right now. Yeah, right. Uh, well, you know, it's, the that's why it's people. interesting what the what the navy's doing i mean it's interesting what the congress is doing because they the first time you know they in september they did come out and they admitted we don't know what these things are and we actually view them as um kind of safety problems that was another thing they kind of dragged that air safety idea uh into uh you know that six page report that they came out with uh they they admitted we don't know what these things are they've never done that before and and that's a little you know that's a little um puzzling i think yeah, yeah. Just to let you know, the lines are open. Um, uh, if you look over to the side, you'll see a, a private chat, and that will let us know uh, when someone comes in. So if you are calling in for a question for our guest, uh, just make sure that you you know turn your whatever you're listening to off once uh, Bill answers. He'll tell you that anyway. But Bill's standing by to screen your calls. That number is 855-472-5483. Again, Bill is standing by. Uh, what are the s- basic um, sizes that, you know, the diversity of these things that are seen? And also, I want to know about the colors. Of, I talked to a guy that was flying, an, I think it was an F-16, an older model, whatever they were, and said that he had a, a green orb following him for 300 miles in the mm-hmm. Air Force. Uh, so what uh, what are... What are some of the colors and sizes? Red, orange, yam- yellow, white, green, blue, different Amber. colors, lots yep. of different colors. Um, yep. You name it, they saw it. Uh, in terms of shapes, yeah, triangles, circles, ovals, bathtubs, uh, long torpedo shaped objects. Some that just defy description. So um, there was a craft that's supposed to have landed in northern Poland in July 1943, and it was made of like two kind of halves with a kind of circling, uh, a a, a middle bit that rotated. Um, But there's very few stories of actually things landing during the war, but that's one of the few. Uh, There's a story in 1941 of a strange-looking cloud where Luftwaffe aircraft were flying around it, and they were getting to the top of this cloud, and then their engines were failing, and they were dropping down again, and then they were flying up again. So there's all sorts of weird and wonderful things that were seen during the war. Um, Mm -hmm. There's some really weird stories out there. Again, they're all covered in the book, but... You know, it's almost the case of it's like a microcosm of what came at the next sort of 80 years. It was all packed into those, you know, four or five years of the war. Oh, this I meant I meant to put this up again. Uh, This came up earlier. Do you see a direct link between the Foo Fighters and any modern UFO sightings? In terms of the disparity between what we have and what, well, it's called for better word, they have, then yes, there's that kind of gap. But also there's the the dog fighting, and you, you might as well call it that, where they're almost playing with our um, sort of you know, best type of technology. Um, and of course, we're, we're still no further forward. So the, the, there's definitely links between what they were seeing then and what we're seeing now. And in terms of the investigations, we're still at the same level. We probably know very little more about what we you know about the, what's going on than we did then. Um, and the certain the same questions are being asked now as what they were back then as well. So yeah, it, it, there's nothing changed. Wow. 
And okay. And this question seems to come up quite a bit. I don't know if you know anything about this at all. Zero. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, and in terms of interest, they for, did have the interest audio, the wall. The, pardon me, for the audio podcast, um, I just have to say what the question is. Michael asks, what are the facts regarding Germany's interest in Antarctica? Before the war, the Germans sent a ship down to Antarctica um, because they called a bit of it, it was Queen Maud Land, they called it New Schwaben Land. And they had a seaplane fly from the, from the ship and it dropped some little swastika flags on the ice. And that was basically the sum total of their, their kind of involvement in Antarctica. Uh, the stories about U-boats going down there during the war, right at the end of the war, never happened. Uh, the stories about Base 211, which is that supposedly the, the Nazi super-secret base on Antarctica, sent me that give me proof because I just don't believe it. And then, of course, you've got Admiral Byrd's ill-fated exp- uh, exploration uh, later in the in the late 1940s where there was a, a, task, a, a fleet went down there with a whole lot of soldiers and they tried to see if they could work out to fight a war down there if they ever needed to. But because it was bad weather, it was it was you know winter for God's sake. They they had a battering in terms of wind and waves, and they had to had to leave quite early because it, it just wasn't working for them. But of course, it's now blown into a story about oh well they, they met a fleet of German flying saucers which attacked them, so they had to run. It, that's sure. the story. That's the narrative that's been built up. Again, if anybody's got any proof of that, great. But so far, there's none. We have uh, we have a couple of people on the line. Our first uh, our first guest is Earl from Washington State. Earl, welcome to the show. You're live on the air. How are you doing? Um, well, how are you doing? And, and, and I, good. I like your style, but I want to ask you a serious question. With the conditions that we find ourselves in today with this pandemic and all the pictures that are popping up all around the planet of these UFOs spraying gases out the back of their ships, and knowing that we're in a Petri dish, what is the... Why no? I haven't heard anybody even come up with the theory that we're being poisoned. Uh, Why would they do it? Why would they do it? Well, you know, there's been other people that have been in, in, you know, disclosing information about UFOs over the years. And I've heard the one guy that went down in the tunnel and got his fingers blown off and then they found him dead in Portland years ago. I heard him mention that there was a certain amount of people that they wanted dead on this planet by a certain amount of time. And you're right. Why would they tell us? But what I'm getting at is that why why the experts that, you know, I see the same things that you see and, and I've heard the same thing that you've heard over the years. And it's just it just makes sense to me. I mean, and when you think about it, why would the Chinese start knocking off their own people with this thing? We know Fauci did this and did that and the other. But you saw and I know if you've seen it or not, but the, it was one of the astronauts that went up on the moon. He's one that was into the crater. And then the, the the reptilians were surrounding him in the crater. And he's the one, in one of the uh, YouTube shows I saw, and he was, there was a woman that said, I got one. I got one. And she had a picture of them that wasn't cloaked. This one was not cloaked. There was two of them. And they were spraying gases out the back of them in California. And now, I, I mean, listen, one minute you got something popping up over in uh, in South Africa. The next minute it's here. Within two days, I mean, they're spraying all over the planet, and I've well, seen it in South Africa. Yeah, I've seen yeah. it everywhere. Well, well, you know, I don't know about any any of this uh, as far as you know what the facts are. I don't know if anyone wants to comment on this. I would just say, uh, um, you know, if they that, if they're looking to kill certain people on Earth, why are they trying to kill everybody on Earth? They should have the technology to hunt out the people that they want to whack and just go in and do it. You know. Um, uh, the UFOs are not spraying the uh, COVID virus over us. There's no such thing as chemtrails. Um, you know, if you believe that stuff, you know, I, I think you should get a hobby or a girlfriend or something. Well, all right. Yeah. Well, I don't, hey, I, don't uh, buy the, I don't buy the chemtrails either, I'm afraid. I've, um, uh, I've Earl, I uh, no read offense. that kind of thing in the 1990s and just and wrote it off back then as well. And right. say, yeah. thanks for no, no offense, Earl, but um, uh, um, this panel anyway – who's on here right now where we don't buy um, a lot of that stuff. Maybe, uh, maybe it's where you're getting your information from, but anyway, we have uh, Patrick now coming up on uh, from Florida. Patrick, welcome to the show. You're live. Thank you. Uh, My question is uh, prior to the Trinity crash in 1945, did the American military have any knowledge that these crafts were otherworldly 
As far as we're aware, no. Um, I say there's no mention of aliens or, or, or extraterrestrials or anything like that in the records. Now, what they were talking about privately, I can't say. But in terms of things you can look at and you can see and you can read for yourself, then no. In terms of, you mentioned Trinity, so you're, you're talking about a nuclear connection there. There were certainly aircraft that were seen over the atomic research plants in 1945. Mm -hmm. Um, but whether that's a, a link or not, I can't say. Um, but yes, you know, in terms of are there records that say we're looking at an extraterrestrial threat or weapons or anything like that? I'm afraid not. There's nothing like that, Patrick. Sorry. Uh, Patrick, okay. you, if, all right. Thank you, Patrick. So the lines are open. If uh, you want to make the call, that number is up there, 855-472-5483. I just heard Patrick's feedback. So if you are calling in, make sure you mute mute your computer or whatever you're listening to for. The, the um, whole idea uh, of that, that these things might be extraterrestrial really, really didn't start until the flying saucer craze. Um, you know, it just seems that way because, you know, during the war, as we've been saying all night, it was just a blanket like, oh, they must be someone else's secret weapons. We have a war to win. It's kind of on the back burner. You know, if we win the war, we'll find out. And that's basically what they did. But, you know, back and then in 1947, for some reason, we we're a little bit yeah, you know, just edging up to the space race, that type of thing. Science fiction was a little more popular. Um, you know, who knows why? And 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 the and the country was bored, you know. And all of a sudden, hey, these things might be from out of space, and you're seeing little green men from Mars. Um, but before that, I don't think anyone way back when, uh, you know, that Churchill story notwithstanding thought that, hey, these things are from someplace and else. Even in, and even in 47, you can still see in the official records the, from different places that they weren't entirely sure that they were Russian as well. Um, right, they yes. couldn't get that quite out of their system. So right. the, the old habits die hard. The things that they were still, it was still the same people that were in charge from the war, and they were still thinking, well, there must be the other sides. So they were still thinking right. that they're not aliens. We can't believe that too much. Are they Russian? So, you know, there, there, were, there was a lot of that going on as well. Mm -hmm. But yes, the alien angle came along in 47, as Max says. We got a couple more callers right now. We have Jeff from Indiana. Jeff, you're live on the air. Yeah, hello. Good evening. I just Hi. want the, um, if either one of your guests there would know uh, if, uh, you know, like Ben Rich, that was the head of skunk work. He said we could take E.T. home and all this stuff as if these were the uh, industrial complex, these people at like Skunk Works, you know, that that were handed this stuff that were not subject to uh, the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, the Pentagon is, but the private industry isn't. But he seemed to talk like he knew more. And I was just wondering if if, if these fellows or anybody... If there's anyone that knows more than than we can possibly even get the information about, like our deepest, darkest projects in, in the United States, you know, that's working on the the most uh, uh, bizarre uh, technology we have. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah, I think if you look at what the history of, of revelations about secret technology, I mean, let's go for the, the, the stealth fighter and the stealth bomber. The, um, they had a, a lead time of what 20 maybe sometimes 25 years between these things being first flown or, or developed and then being unveiled to the public and really in the 19, late 1940s or early 1950s if the US government or, or something like that had had some kind of secret technology that they were, they were mucking about with or they're developing it would have been out by now mm -hmm. and that would, that would go for even stuff in the late 50s and even to the 1960s we would have seen evidence of this technology by now, right. somehow, whether it was something that slipped out somewhere um, or it was a picture that was a proper picture that you could say, yeah, that's definitely something, you know, uh, or mm -hmm. they just came out with it and said, yeah, we've got this, like they did with the F117, like they did with the B2. Right. Nothing like that ever happened. And even to a certain extent, Aurora, that mythical weapon system, that's never been seen. There's been people who have said they've seen it. There's been drawings of it. There's been, you know, all this kind of stuff. But it's never been sort of, yeah, okay, we've got it. You know, this is it. Um, right. There was, a, there was a, the thing called the AV6, the Astra project. It 
nearly crashed in a place in, in England uh, in 1994. It, it crashed on a runway. It had an undercarriage malfunction. And they had to put it under a tarpaulin, and put it into a hangar, and then flew it out to Palmdale the next day. But they've never unveiled that either. And um, a defence journalist in the UK, a guy called Nick Cook, who um, I've been in, I've spoke to before, he was actually taken on a, on a, a tour of uh, of the, the Lockheed facilities, and he saw reference to it on a poster in a room, uh, and then he was hurried out when he mentioned about it. So um, you know they probably do have something like that, but for some reason they've never said, oh yeah, it exists. But whether or not that's actually something exotic, or whether it's just a, a little follow-on from a stealth fighter, is anybody's guess really. Um, sure. you, know, you can't really tell, I'm afraid. Um, right. the, the, another good example is this, and, and, you know, we talk about this in the show, is that, you know, if the U.S. government had some kind of, you know, reverse engineered UFO technology, whatever, why would they go through this whole facade of, um, you know, launching the space shuttle? Now, the space shuttle was like shooting a dump truck into orbit. OK, it was expensive. You know, it wasn't it wasn't very efficient. Um, it was the most uh, the most complicated machine ever built by man. Why would you do that if you had the secret of you know anti grav or something like that, and you've been sitting on it for decades? First of all, why would you sit on it? You know, why wouldn't you exploit it? Number two, why would you go through all that or any of the any of the moon shots or anything? They were all ballistically shot into orbit. You know, you you the the, the Saturn V would burn up all of its fuel just to get a capsule into orbit, basically. You know, why would you go through all that if you had some kind of secret, you know, from uh, reverse-engineered UFOs? They don't. We'd live in a different world if they did. Yeah, and, and, and there's some proponents of this so-called secret space force right. or space program, but I don't believe that either. It's because, baloney. again, the people who sort of spout this stuff, they never have any proof. It's all kind of smoke and mirrors. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, really, you know, I deal with facts. My book's about facts. You know, yes. I don't go in for speculation. Speculation is all well and good, and it's great to talk about stuff that I don't mind talking about it. But if you're going to sort of throw it out there as a fact, I want something a bit more than just somebody saying they did something. Um, you know, yeah. I, I, don't, I need something I can get my teeth into that I can see, that I can read, that I can touch. And if, if that doesn't exist, then I'm afraid I'm a bit sort of, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll you know. I'll just back off now. Thank you. Yeah, you know, a little. I, uh, we have we have a couple more people on the line, and just something I, I'll say that I never really talk about because uh, it's behind, you know, the fourth walls they say or whatever. But I do get contacted by a lot of people that want to be on my show, and um, and all the time the secret space program type people want to come on my show sure. and talk about it. And uh, um, so I, I'm just I'm just not up for. I I like the facts. The facts, people, and this has been a really good show, uh, in my opinion. Uh, we have. Let's I just, see. We, I just want to say, could I say something? You're still there, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, I'm still here. I just want to say something. I, I thought that what Ben Rich said, if that was correct, he said that he we can take ET home. He even stated that anything you saw in Star Trek, we've done, been there. Done Why it. haven't we done it already, Jeff? That's the question. And do you think he was pulling our leg or was he lying about that? Because that's yeah. pretty extreme technology. Yeah. The teleportation. Yeah. Um, why haven't why haven't we done it already? Is the question then. Why would yeah, he we talk about we've got the capability? Why can't we do it now? Yeah. Thank you. Why, why can't why do I have to sit in in England? Why can't I just teleport myself across to to, to, to Martin's house and do the show there? <laughs> do the show live. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, anyway, thank you. Thank you for the call, Jeff. Jeff's a, a frequent flyer, um, calls a lot. We have Elton. Now, Elton is uh, I, actually Elton's been on the show, talked about his UFO sighting. If it, it has to be him, right? El Elton, is that you from yes, Oakland sir. area, California? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, uh, Martin, that's me. Hi. Welcome to the show. You have a, you have a question for our guest? Yeah, I heard Graham mention something about fireballs. He has such a wide knowledge of different phenomenon. And uh, I've never mentioned this to you, uh, Martin, but early, uh, just before COVID struck in 2020 in March, I was driving home and this fireball came, came down at about a 30 degree angle, about 20 feet in diameter. But just recently, I, I didn't really consider it to be a UFO. So I'm kind of confused because this, I expected it to blow up when it passed me on the freeway and it didn't. 
I heard nothing. So I was just wondering to see what you guys think. If you don't mind, I'll, if you don't mind, I'll take that one to begin with. Um, I okay. I had a uh, the much more incredible than the UFO was a fireball sighting back in the late 1980s. This thing, to me, it was huge. It looked, what's that? It, it, looked, uh, it looked perfectly round. It was rotating. It had cracks in it. There were sparks flying off of it. And I thought this thing was going to land like a few miles out into the ocean. I lived about three miles away from the Atlantic Ocean. Hmm. And supposedly something landed in China. So, um, you know, it looks like it's going to land, but that doesn't mean that that's just the perspective that you're seeing it at. Right. I, I, saw, sure. I saw a green fireball in 2016, about two or three miles from where I live. Uh, I was driving home one night at about 11 o'clock and it flew over the car heading northbound and it looked close and it was large, but... It actually, when, you, when the next day when I, I investigated a bit more, it turned out that other people had seen it in Scotland. So, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. That's, Interesting. I mean, I do live in northern England. I'm actually next to the border of Scotland. But people have seen it in the far north of Scotland as well. And it had been seen mm-hmm. in, the, in the south of England. So it had flown quite a way. And people were just seeing it different places. But to me, you know, it looked huge. And it was leaving a bit of a, a green trail behind it, as you say, with sparks and things coming out of it. But... I sort of knew straight away that's a, that's a meteor fragment, um, and it's going to burn up at some stage because you know, I'd heard about these things before, but I'd never seen one until then. But it was really impressive, and I right, certainly yeah. had to stop the car and just well, go, "Wow!" <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, it looked unreal. We saw one uh, on a honeymoon, <laughs> to the truth, over the beach in Block Island, and it looks unreal. It looks like a cartoon or something. It just it just looks unreal, you know, and and huge, and and then you you don't realize that people are probably on the other side of the Atlantic seeing the same thing. You're right. Hey, Elton, good yeah, to hear I, from you. Uh, sighting, it was directly flew directly over the car, over the freeway, and it was right 50, 75 feet in front of my windshield, and I really got a good look at it. It looked just like uh, the one you described, Martin. Elton, can I ask you a question? How do you know how big it was? Well, I mean, it was right in front of me. It was bigger yeah, but than... How do you, but it's something that you don't know what it is. So how, do, how do you know how big it was? Because this is the thing about... I mean, well, I say this all the time with people estimating sizes and distances. If you don't know how big something is, you can't tell how far away it is. Uh, hmm. I understand true. what you're saying. The center core was molten lava-like, and then the, mm-hmm. around the perimeter, it was like fire... Uh, around the edges of it. I mean, it was it was pretty sizable. Okay, because the thing I saw from the car, look, I could have. It looked at one point it was all kind of off. You put my hand up and touch it, but mm. actually it was because it it was quite it was quite fast and it was obviously quite large, but it was still quite a distance away. But I couldn't tell you how big it was, nor can I really tell you how far away it was, because things like this and this is the whole thing about ufology, about people estimating distances and sizes. When you've got something you don't know what it is. You can't tell how big it is, yes. so therefore you can't really tell how far away it is, and vice versa, if you see what I mean. But, yeah, yeah you probably saw yes. something along the lines of what Mac, Martin and I saw. It would be just a, it would be a meteor fragment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey, thanks for the call, Elton. We have another caller to get to. I appreciate it, and, and talk to you soon. All right, we have our last caller for the night. Ken, I can't remember where you're from. Ken, you're live in the air. Where are you from? Yeah, another caller to get to. Uh, I'm from Los Angeles. Hi, Ken. Welcome to the show. You have a question for our guest? Uh, yeah. Well, actually, I have a, um, uh, something I want to talk about. Lou Elizondo was recently on a um, some presentation, and he was talking about how he had read documents that were written in Latin of soldiers talking about, you know, seeing these shiny objects in the sky. And we also know that there are cave paintings of UFOs. And, you know, all throughout history, we've heard about these crafts flying around in our skies, right? We're not, we're not talking about these crafts flying around other planets. Well, Lou Elizondo was also talking about how we recently became aware of a, of a new kingdom, you know, the mycelium kingdom, right? We thought it was just the plant kingdom and the animal kingdom. But then, you know, like 150 years ago, we realized that there was the mycelium kingdom, which is even bigger. And he alluded to the fact that we are going to come to a point where we realize that there is another life form or another intelligence sharing the planet with us. 
Yes, I heard that. I heard that interview. That was fascinating to me. And uh, and, and yeah, that kind of gave me the chills when I heard him talk about that. Can we blame like maybe, them? Can we blame them? We're not. Everything has gone wrong. Yeah. Right. Maybe we're not the top of the food chain. Maybe we're not the top of the intelligence that's already here. Uh, L- I want to know more about that. And yeah, I, all L- I can L- tell L- you. Sorry, go on. All I can tell you is I'm going to be interviewing um, Lou in March. And, you know, that's definitely a topic I'm really going to try to get more information from him about. Lou's a very interesting guy. I, I, was, I was fortunate to meet him at the end of October this uh, this year uh, in London. Um, and he, you know, what he knows, who knows what he knows, uh, is what I'll say. Um, but he comes out with some very interesting things. He's certainly worth listening to. Um, and I think you have to like maybe listen again to what he says every time because he might be leaving little breadcrumbs here and there. But yeah, he's he's definitely worth listening to. Yeah. Yeah, but I also don't you know just not listen to him. I can also just you know use my own intellect and deduce that. Sure. All of these sightings that people are having, they, you know, we people have been seeing crafts under the water for literally thousands of years. People have been seeing crafts coming in and out of our oceans, in and, in and out of our volcanoes. That's so, true. yeah, we are not the only species on this planet. It's kind of obvious that that there are these, well, I call them underwater neighbors. Uh, and yeah, and could we monitor our, um, our military our military facilities, the Russians know that if they want to want to get the, these crafts to show up, all they have to do is amass their military um, or weapons and things or military gear around and the UFOs show up. You know, they're not they're, again, they're not showing up from another planet. They're not showing up from another dimension or from the from the future. Right. They're popping up out of out of this ocean in this time. And that's yeah. all I got to say. All right. Well, okay. I appreciate the call, Ken. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Yeah, I mean that is that is interesting. You know, the the uh, for instance, you know, the USOs is a whole nother a whole nother thing that uh, you know has been seen forever by mm-hmm. military as well. Suppose you know, I mean, I talked to Mark D'Antonio who saw firsthand on a submarine uh, test run he was on, you know, where this fast mover going several hundred knots underwater. Nothing can explain in our technology, especially, you know, 20 years ago. Um, there's nothing that we had, as far as I know, that would ever go that type of speed. So a, a really good mystery. Another one. So um, I would like to ask you, Graham, we only have we only have two minutes left. It's just we have to we have to wrap right up at, okay. at in two minutes. But um, someone like you writing this type of book, I want to read stuff that you write. Okay. I want to read, so I want you to write more. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I'm planning to. Don't worry. Yeah. Uh-huh. So let's uh, let's hear what you have something in mind. So I'm working on something at the moment, which I'm not uh, sort of a little bit to discuss at the moment, but it'll probably be out sometime in the new year. Um, I mean, in terms of the book, if you want to read this, I don't know if you have it already, Martin, but there's there's the book. So that's uh, UFOs before Roswell. And it's got the uh, it's got the picture on the front of the the Wellington encounter that was done by a couple of good friends of mine, Dan Zetterstrom and Olaf Rockner, uh, who comes from Sweden. Um, so they came up with that. And if you see the forward is by Sean Cahill, who was one of the witnesses to the 2004 uh, Nimitz encounters. Oh wow! Um, so he was on print. He was the he was on Princeton at the time. So um, he was good enough to do the forward for me. So the books are available on Amazon. Um, I've got other books which are, avail- are, are to do with aircraft, wh- which are on there as well. But I'm working on another UFO book, which will be out in the uh, in the new year. I'm also looking to do a book about the Pacific War in terms of Foo Fighters as well at some stage, which I'm in the early stages of looking at. But also, I'm still finding information about the European side. So hopefully there'll be another follow-on volume for that as well. And if anybody wants to talk to me, uh, my Twitter handle's there. That's uh, at Borders750. You can get in touch with me that way. All right. I do want to talk to you too, because I have something to talk about uh, with you uh, from someone I spoke to at some point. So I will be in touch with you. Thanks so much. We are right at the end of our time. All right. Take care. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye now. And Mac, uh, quickly, yeah. just a quick second. When's your show? Where can people find Military people can find Okay. On uh, the best place to go to look for us is on Apple Podcasts, Mac Maloney's Military X-Files on Apple Podcasts. All right. Um, uh, just Google Mac Maloney's Military X-Files. You'll find us eventually.
All right. Excellent. So thanks so much, Max. Sorry, you can hear me. And I'm saying thank you to you. Uh, but anyway, next week, Paul Hynek, Paul, uh, Paul Hynek's son, J. Allen Hynek's son. Uh, always a fun time. He's a great guy. I'm really looking forward to that. Thanks so much. And remember to keep your eyes to the sky. Mm-hmm.